Hey, somebody needs to call Roger. You have? Excellent. Good morning, afternoon, or evening. You are listening to The Professional Noticer. Hello, everyone. I'm Andy Andrews. Hey, thank you for making me a part of your week. My purpose here today and with every show we do is to play the part of best friend or a coach. I want to help you live the life of your wildest dreams by giving you access to the greatest mentors the world has to offer today. Hey, uh, while I'm thinking about it, wisdomharbor.com is attempting to put the whole team on the field for your family. For less than $3 a month, you'll have access to original content only found on wisdomharbor.com that'll have a positive effect on your personal and professional life. Utilizing video, audio, and the written word, content is delivered in small bites by Grammy winners, CEOs, comedians, master chefs, best-selling authors, and coaches. And there are even guitar lessons from an award-winning songwriter. So check it out today and join your friends and neighbors who are already a part of wisdomharbor.com. Observations and answers are what we do here. And you know we love it when somebody comes to the table with both. And today we have a, a very special guest. I got to know this young man after he wrote his book. Now, I had known his father for a long time. His dad and I uh, connected professionally. His dad is a legend in our state, and uh, his dad is Joey Jones, who's all-American from Alabama, played for Bear Bryant, five foot eight, wide receiver, four, two, one, forty. This is like blazing speed. And and I played in the pros with the Falcons and the Stallions. So it, and and then coached college football. And so I've known Joey for a long time. And I just met his son, Jacob, just come into a contact with the, the whole family. They've got a place down here. And, and this book, Recovered by Jacob Jones, and, and the subtitle is How an Unsustainable Addiction Led to a Sustained Life. You know, I had this sitting around for a couple of weeks, and I knew Jacob was coming into town, and so I picked it up and said, I need to read this, just, you know, at least go through it a little bit before Jacob comes into town. And I started reading the night before last, and, and I could not put it down. And so this is one of those one of those books, and I'm about to introduce Jacob, but I want to tell you before we get going, uh, I've read, read a lot of books about parents who lost their children and the grieving parents. And then when I read Sherry Burgess's book, Bronner, that was a different level. It was a different book. That was the book. That that has become the book that I recommend for any situation like that. And I had never come across a book that I considered the gold standard in, in this kind of book for understanding, for parents to be able to understand, and for young adults to be able to understand what actually happens until I read this. And, and I'm... I'm relieved that you are here. I'm honored that you're here. And so thank you for joining us, Jacob. Yeah, Andy, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And thank you um, for your kind words about the book. And it's as I'm sitting here listening to you, it's it's even, um, I don't even know what to think, honestly. It's, it's extraordinarily humbling. Um, you and I were talking a little bit previously about how I was even able to be in my right mind to, to write a book and, and not even that, but to, to put this book out and what God has done since then. So thank you so much. Thank you for the kind words. Thank you for Buddy, having me. I, I'm sitting here and having read the book the night before last, mm. and I talked to your mother a long time last night. And then I watch you sitting across from me right now speaking, and I 
I this is uh, this is giving me kind of the 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 goosebumps on the arms because you know the, the, there are people that tell their story and say uh, you know by all rights I should not be sitting here but I I can't believe that you are mentally fine and yeah. because of of everything that happened and and that you are moving ahead and and this Jacob this book I know what it takes to write a book and this is your first book your only book I guess and it is and uh, you you nailed something very special in this book because you you don't just tell the story you dig into the origins you dig into the why it happened as it did and how ridiculous or insane certain things were and and what happened and what you put your family through and so you know, I, I know it's got to be, now, and I know people would throw this at your feet. Got to be, got to be tough growing up and right. in the in the house of a legend. But well, I like about the legend. You said that he was five foot eight. You know, I really appreciate you saying that because he <laughs> everybody always teases him about being shorter than he actually is. So he's he's probably five ten, five eleven. Oh really? But I love it that you knocked him down a peg or two. Oh, and okay. kept him humble. <laughs> okay, and, but, I, I thought I read that he was five eight. <laughs> probably, I'm sure they put that somewhere, which is hilarious. But his forty speed was accurate. Um, this is my dad that we're talking about, but um, extremely fast. But there was there was definitely some of that um, growing up and and kind of a um, this thing to live up to. Um, the thing is, he never put that on me. It was just something that I had on myself and kind of, you know, just, just walking that out. But um, back to your point of what you were talking about, um, being in, in, in right mental standing to even have this conversation with you. And and I know you hear that a lot, and, and it's so true that people that come through addiction, it, it truly is a miracle. And I just really want people to know that if you have friends, family members around you to celebrate them for, for being, you know, walking out of life of sobriety because— the reality is, I remember the first time that I, I came out of a, a rehab facility, they said that there's a 95% chance that I'll be back. 95. 95% chance. And I remember thinking, that's that's not true. This I got this. You know, I got it. And sure enough, I was back. And and I see the, the further and further I go, how much, to your point, how much of a miracle it is for people to, to walk this out um, because a lot of people don't make it out. And, and there are certainly times... Um, you know, uh, at times when, you know, that, that I wrote about in the book where I was in the hospital and the doctors were saying that, um, you know, they gave the caveat of if he makes it out of the hospital. Because at that point, the, the point that you're alluding to, and I'm not going to give too much away, but I don't mind talking about all this yeah, stuff. Yeah, go, go ahead. Um, so I, I was in, actually, this was kind of got down to the point where it, it continued to get really bad in my active addiction. And I was at a point where I was in the, I, I'd given my mom all of my drugs, and, and I said, "I'm done." You know. I, and so, so let's let's back up. And how did this start? How, how did this start? Mm-hmm. So this all started really. Um, I always had struggled with anxiety. Um, uh, struggled with um, fear of being rejected by my peers. Um, living up. And um, I'm sure people looking at me at that time wouldn't have pegged that because I was doing well athletically, you know, gearing up to start to get some scholarship offers and stuff like that. So this is around. But you took a pill and realized, hey, this makes me feel better. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And it was all fun and games at the right. beginning. And then it progressed into something. Um, fast forward, had full scholarship offers to several different places, went to the University of Alabama, and um, then tore my quads multiple times and had to take a medical release. So at that, I found that I didn't have really any purpose in my life anymore. Um, the shame and guilt and pain of not being able to go and be that. And really, the identity was stripped away was one of the most profound things that I saw looking back, that my identity was more of an Alabama football player than it was Jacob. 
And that was something that I had to just sit with. And I did not like sitting with that. I didn't like the the anxiety, the sleepless nights, um, feel like I'm letting everybody down that knew me. And that had been an issue from the beginning, the anxiety yeah. about who you were. And and so it's, it's interesting that it— and it was healthy to an extent, but football was kind of my drug, so to speak, to cover some of those things up because I could go and, and, and it was a healthy, I'm not saying football was inherently a negative thing, but in looking back, I was using it too, to cover up some of those feelings and emotions. Um, but they're always underlying there. And then an event like that happened and brought them all back up again. Okay. So, so then you're, you're out of football. And and now you're you're taking and you're you're getting prescriptions wherever you can get them. And mm-hmm. so what's happening now? At that time, I really again I had I had no real purpose in my life. Um, I, I I had worked my whole life, worked extremely hard to become you know a Division One athlete, put in hours after practice, hours before practice. So when that all got stripped away. I really didn't have any purpose in my life. So I just kind of started using more and more drugs because the the feelings of that shame and guilt and anxiety, the sleepless nights became more and more intense. And I just tried to reach for anything I could. And and in the end, what I what I was doing was I was taking physical things and trying to fill a spiritual void. And in reality, that's never going to work. And so it happened that that void on the inside of me was just continuing to grow, continuing to get bigger. And therefore, I was reaching for more and more potent things to get my hands on. And, you know, I, as I read this book, my eyebrows were crawling up into my hairline because I was, I mean, you know, we're involved with youth reach mm-hmm. here in this area. And... Uh, your dad and mom right now are today are doing a, a golf tournament to right. raise funds for youth reach of Baldwin County and this is young men at risk and and we we're it, it, it's it's obvious this is not these are not bad kids or what you would call disadvantaged kids that are getting involved here this is this is every walk of life, every walk of life. I mean, you were, yeah. I mean, you were not a disadvantaged kid, and no. and um, and so. I, but as I read this, I was, I I guess I was kind of blown away at the amounts. I, I mean, because I, I mean, twenty one Ambien at one time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I had no clue that I was taking fatal amounts of a lot of this stuff. Um, I didn't. I didn't know that people were taking that um, in, intentionally to not wake up the next morning. Right. I, I had no clue, and when it all kind of came to a head for my family, my brother's a pharmacist. <laughs> right. And so he he looks at my mom and he says, "Mom, if if I took what he was taking, not only that, if I took a quarter amount of what he was taking, I'd be dead right now." And so that's when serious alarm bells, and this was, you know, back in the journey of active addiction, but that's when serious alarm bells started going off for my family, knowing how, wow, this is a for real problem. Yeah, and this was before the past few years we've heard a lot about this. This was— Right. Yeah, and so so what— and I, and I, and I'm curious about the— You know, I, I read this in several different ways because I read this as a as a father. I've got two young adult sons. I read this. I still feel like a I still feel like a young adult. You know, mm-hmm. even though I'm not. Um, so I could still feel the son in me. I could feel the guy in me, and and I read it as a like a citizen or. And then as just a, a family member, as a business owner of the community, I tried to put on different hats as I was reading this. Mm. And, and it was it was amazing to me. And you made—one of the things that I think is amazing about this book is you, 
you go, this, this is a page turner. I mean, you can't put this book down, but Jacob goes slow enough in explaining what is happening. He is explaining his thoughts. You remember, um, remember the, uh, oh, the, the movie, A Christmas Story, mm-hmm. where the kid wants to be again? And so the adult is explaining what the kid is thinking on the screen. Right. That's right. what this book is like. You, you've got a, a, an adult that's looking back and saying, now this is what he's thinking, right? This is what I was thinking at that point. And he's examining his thoughts. And so if you want to really get, get deep into the mind, I mean, because I know as a parent, if you're if you're experiencing something like this, your first your first question is, what is he thinking? Mm-hmm. What are they thinking? I, I don't even know how they're thinking. Well, this will help. And and so I was amazed to see how it would be like. Okay, all right. I, I mean, I'm 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 watching the book, and I'm going, Jacob, you're right here, mm-hmm. and you're seeing you are a step and a half away from the cliff. And and so you're not going to go toward that cliff. Surely you're not going to go toward that cliff. And you go, whoop, and take a step toward that cliff. And go, now, Jacob, you know the next step is off the cliff. And you just step off the cliff. Yeah. What was that like? It's... And I, and I was, let me just say, I was particularly interested when you had a dividing road. There was a friend that you'd been doing drugs with, mm-hmm. and and y'all had been doing the same kind of drugs, the same amount of drugs, right. and then you were separated for a couple of months, so you mm-hmm. talked on the phone, and you said, hey, where are you getting so-and-so? And he said, Jake, I'm not doing that anymore. And you're like, you're not? Yeah. And you talking. were stunned. You were stunned that— he was able to just put it down. It was incomprehensible to you. Mm-hmm. So, and you said that you realized there there was a difference in some kind of people, right? So, um, people that uh, that experience true active addiction. It's the the best way that I can describe this this um, insatiable appetite to go and use again is to every normal person, so you've gone without a meal before or maybe a day, um, whether it's through intentionally through fasting or your day just gets going, and then all of a sudden you're hungry. Like you're, you're getting really, really hungry. And then let's say you extend that to two days and to three days. I, I liken that very much to addiction when somebody doesn't have drugs in the sense of that primal drive to get food the person in active addiction has this primal drive to get the drugs and alcohol, and even more so than the food, because I've gone two and three days without food before in my active addiction, but the only thing I can think about is if it's coupled with not having drugs or alcohol is getting the next fix. So you can imagine how hungry you would be two and three days in. And then on top of that, it's having family members and loved ones just saying, well, if you love me enough, you just just don't think about it. Just don't do it. And if you could imagine that that huge, that, that feeling of like, I am so hungry. Uh, I just need something to eat. And so it's that feeling amplified by a lot more because what in the brain, cognitively, it actually hijacks the brain and becomes primary even over the feeling of needing to eat. Because if, if I could eat just a little bit, just then a little I can bit. take care of it. I love you. I can yeah, love you. Exactly. It's amazing. It is, it's fascinating how powerful that pull of addiction is. It, it truly is. So what happened? How did How did— how did you break this? Because this this lasted forever, and this almost killed you. It did, and it yeah. did kill friends. Yes, it did, and even you know seeing that as I as I go, and you know we touched on it before, but uh, I've come to see that not a lot of people make it out of addiction. I know that we hear about people with success stories a lot, and and praise God for that. But there's equally as much, and even a lot more people that are stuck in it and never make it out of addiction. And um, the turning point for me was I remember my aunt looked at me 
Um, and my family is amazing. You know, we're talking about all these stories. They love me through it all. And that's, and I know we say the love of God, but I think the love of God manifests in this world is through people. Um, and as close to an unconditional love can be, that's what my family showed me. And, and I took it for granted basically the whole time. Um, you know, I did my best to love them back, but looking back in hindsight, nothing was going to be king over my drugs and alcohol. And I, I said they would, and I truly thought that, you know, I love my family more or love God more than the drugs and alcohol. But looking back, nothing was king over that because when push came to shove, I was going to get that thing over anything else. And so my family there was there loving me through it the whole entire time. And um, so there, that that hand of love that kind of sustained me through the whole um, the whole bit. And then at the end, the thing that scared me the most, back to your original question, kind of what was the big thing, there's always a lot of um, events that happen leading up to these types of things. When somebody goes to rehab, you don't just skip into a rehab facility and say, you know what, I think today I'm going to go to rehab right. and it's going to be a great day. They probably got bologna sandwiches for me <laughs> and, you know, a lot, a lot of good things, going to make some good friends. It's, it's not like that. There's there's always almost certainly very, very large consequences driving somebody into in to get changed when they're coming out of a life of active addiction, because we talked about the power of that driving into that. There must be something that's pretty powerful pushing that person into a life of active addiction. Um, so there's almost certainly always consequences. And I remember one of them amongst you know several other things. My aunt came to me and she said, you know that you're about to completely sever ties with your family, right? And, you know, this was, you know, very late stages of my active addiction. I looked at her and I was thinking, no, I did not realize that. You know, in my head, I'm thinking, well, they've always been there for me and no matter what. So I never could comprehend the fact that, hey, if you keep pushing this a little bit further, they're going to cut you off completely, and it's just going to be you on your own. And that thought terrified me of losing my family and not having any contact with them, not having any support from them, um, you know, letting them down, uh, all these things. Uh, I never really comprehended that fact, and that was one of the one of the bigger driving factors to me getting help. So there had to have been in this long process, have you, when you finally, for the last time, did seek help mm -hmm. and you went after it, was there, was, can you look at a, a moment where you, you crossed the Rubicon? Were you, were you like clicked over? There, there was a moment um, I, I remember, and uh, when I was still in the rehab facility that I was in at that time. So the last time, you know, a little over six years ago now, and I remember um, having this thought, and it was a brand new thought to me that I'd never thought before in the past decade. And I've been going through doing intensive process groups, just dredging up all these feelings that we previously talked about of shame and guilt and fear of rejection by peers and going through all the negative consequences that I had going on in my life. And then I remember getting to a point a couple months in, I think it was probably around three months or so. And I thought, man, I could never use drugs and alcohol again in my life. And I remember thinking that like, gosh, that's crazy. And then my follow-up thought was, I think I'm okay with that. And that window of, I think I'm okay with that, was a complete revelation. Because up until that point, I could never, it, it's two-part, I could never imagine being sober, A, I, I could never even fathom, there's no category in my brain anymore for living life without drugs and alcohol. And then B, on top of that, it was even more ludicrous, even crazier that I would enjoy a life without drugs and alcohol. And so to have that thought of, you know what, if I never use drugs and alcohol again in my life, I think I'll be okay. That was a light bulb moment for me. Wow. 
So now you're married. You, you're living in Orlando. Yeah. And and tell us what you're doing. So now um, my day job, what I like to call it, is um, I, I serve as the director of missions and outreach um, at my church, a live church, and um, absolutely amazing church. The, the people there have been uh, with me through this whole journey, really, the past six years. Um, I was actually started going to the church when I was in uh, in rehab. And we get, I call it the druggy buggy. We get shipped there in the druggy buggy. And then, you know, you know, five to 10 of us would go and then come back. I remember going and getting baptized again um, in my full clothes and uh, coming back wet in the van. And um, so the church has been an instrumental part of my life. And I think the biggest change there, too, um, is, is being active. You know, I, I used to treat church like I uh, had a membership to church, like a gym membership that I never right. used. And so when you have a gym membership, you know, uh, and don't use it, it's not that nothing changes, but actually you get worse. If you continue to sit on the couch, you get a little bit bigger, a little more unhealthy. And the the same was for me, spiritually speaking. And um, But anyways, fast forward, um, it's been an amazing instrumental part of my life, and that's what I get to do today. I met my wife on the mission field in Nicaragua, um, and she was one of our translators there. And always tease people and say that I was on a different mission, apparently. Indy. You know, Indy. Indy. I was on, yeah, yeah. Mission Indy. And um, so it's it's amazing uh, what God has, e- this book, Mission Trips, so what I get to do today is absolutely amazing. And I'm still in awe that I'm over six years sober to this day. Well, buddy, we are, we are happy for you. Uh I am proud for you and proud of you. I know I know how relieved and proud your parents are. Mm-hmm. And I and I know that you would not choose this in a million years again. But I, I hope you make great use and I and I'm proud that you are making great use of this massive platform that has been provided for you because I think you have a unique understanding. I think that you can explain a lot more than other people that I've heard. I think you mm-hmm. can connect in a deeper way. And um, I think you can make a huge difference. You guys, I would really urge you. Thank you, Jacob, for being with yes, us. Sir. And I, I would just... Uh, urge you not not to get just one copy of this but get three copies of it get because you know you know people that need to read this book and and so we will put uh, how to get this book in the show notes and and uh and we appreciate you being here I'm Andy Andrews the professional noticer, harnessing common sense and wisdom to plow through challenges all the way to an answer for you. And I think that'll do it for this week. Get us out of here, Matthew. So, ladies and gentlemen, and to the boys and girls who aspire to become ladies and gentlemen, we've reached the end of another episode of The Professional Noticer. In a world where common sense has become a superpower, I'm harnessing the tiny bit of mental energy I have for you. Seeking wisdom, making observations, and endeavoring to answer tough questions in a way that will empower your family and your business. I'm Andy Andrews. Until next week, goodbye. This episode of The Professional Noticer was produced by Matt Limpert. The Noticer theme, written and performed by Sugarcane Jane. Creole seasoning for the cast and crew has been provisioned by a separate agreement with Twinkle and Smoke of Beverly Hills. Additional funding provided by YesThatNotThat.com, the decision website for newly married couples. Guys, do you remember the days when you were first confused by the question, which color looks best on me? Can you recall the confusion you produced by asserting that both, indeed all, colors look good on her? Do you remember her frustration with you at that moment? Do you remember the fight? Today, a young man can quickly scan his wife with our smartphone app and say, yes, that, not that. She's happy, you're cool, and all is well. So that's yes, that, not that. 
Com, the instant decision maker that can actually save your relationship. But ladies, if you subscribe now, we will add the whatever app to your package free of charge. Then when your husband asks, is it okay if I wear this tonight? You can quickly scan his attire and have your answer. These are the decision apps, whatever.com and yes, that, not that.com.